One, two, testing. Am I there? Okay, were you? Did you mute me? Okay, because. Well, good morning. Let me welcome you this morning to Oak Bend Church, those of you who are here in the sanctuary, and then those of you that are joining us online today. Either way, glad you're here this morning. A uh, couple of announcements uh, just for you. One is we're going to be taking communion together this morning following the message. So if you came in today and you did not pick up the elements out there, please do that before that time. Also, if you happen to be visiting with us today, we practice what's known as open communion here, which means you don't have to be a member uh, to take communion, but you do need to be a believer, need to be part of God's family. So if that's you, we would love for you to partake with us. So please, again, if you haven't picked up the elements, uh, let me uh, just ask you to do that before uh, we get to the message this morning. Uh, Second, uh, if you are a junior or senior high youth or parents of one. There's going to be a meeting this morning after church upstairs in the youth room uh, for uh, our quizzing program. Uh, FEC, uh, Fellowship of Evangelical Churches that we're a part of, uh, many of their churches have Bible quizzing teams, and throughout the year they quiz each other, and it's a good way to learn the scriptures. So if that's something that you're interested in, 
then please take a moment after church to go upstairs in the youth room here and um, set in on that meeting. One other thing, not in our slides, but I just want to say a big thank you uh, to everyone that had a part in our VBS. We finished it up this past Wednesday. Uh, the uh, Perrysburg firemen and policemen were here also, which was great. The kids love that. I love that, and I'm a big kid. So it was great. You got to sit in the car, look at everything. Uh, it was just a great, great time this year. So thank you if you served uh, in some way over these past three months, and that we really appreciate you doing that. Uh, we're going to worship together, but to get us started, I want us to hear some words that Paul wrote in the book of Romans. He said, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments, his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. When you think about worshiping today, that's the God you're worshiping today. That's the God, the God whose riches and wisdom are beyond anything you or I can really grasp. We don't counsel him. He counsels us. We don't give him advice. He gives us advice and direction. And the bottom line Paul says is, look, does God need us? No. But does God love us and draw us to himself? Oh, yes, he does. And that's the God we come to worship this morning. So I want to encourage you to put your whole being into worship today and to lift him up as we sing together. So would you stand with me? And then let's pray together. And then we're going to sing our praises to God this morning. Father, we love you this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to be together. We thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, this morning. And oh, how deep are the wisdom and um, knowledge that is his. And yet he opens that to us as we are willing to listen. And how deep is his love for us. A love that is everlasting. And we praise and we thank you that you would love us to the point, Lord Jesus, that you gave yourself up for us. So we come this morning to give ourselves to you, to praise you, to glorify you, to make much of you because you deserve it. You are King of kings and Lord of lords, and to you be glory and honor this morning through the church. Amen and amen. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah, heaven comes to fight for me, I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm, louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar, up from the ashes, hope will arise, death is defeated, the king is alive. I raise a hallelujah with everything inside of me. I raise a hallelujah. I will watch the darkness flee. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah, fear you lost your hold on me, I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm, louder and louder, 
The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and tremble at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how
is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. You're the name above all. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth wisdom. Night after night, they bring forth knowledge. There is no speech or language under heaven where their sound is not heard. If the heavens declare the glory of God, how much more should we sing his greatness and his goodness and his glory? So please join us in singing goodness of God. Running after, it's running after me. Your goodness 
Thank you so much for your goodness that you have lavished on us, even when we don't deserve it, because we don't deserve it. Thank you for making a way to you in the midst of our sin and our pain and our despair. Thank you for not leaving us on our own to suffer the consequences of our sins, but for making making a way, for sending your son to die on a cross to save us so that we could be with you. Please be with our children this morning as they go up to children's church, be with the children's workers and just help them to have a really wonderful blessed time together and a time that will help them all to see you in a new and deeper way. And just um, please bless Pastor Daniel as he preaches to us this morning and please help us all to be able to see things about you we've never seen before and just keep you the center of our of our learning and of our worship this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, again, good morning. Let me welcome you, and it's good to be with you again. Thankful to uh, the missionaries over the past couple of weeks who shared and gave my uh, family and I time to get away on a little vacation. Uh, those of you that are kind of familiar with my family probably know uh, that when we do our vacations, um, my wife and I always, somewhere in that vacation, find a moment to interject what I call an historical moment. Uh, and what I mean by that is we find some place to go that has some kind of history attached to it. Uh, we do that, first of all, because me and my wife are selfish and we enjoy history. Um, so there it is. Our kids get drug along. We love it. We like to enjoy it. Uh, but we also do it because we want our kids to have some understanding of historical events and places and people. And, and I do because I have found that um, when you read history, it really um, helps give you a perspective uh, many times on your life today. Uh, an example, sometimes we, we get really worked up about how bad we think things are. And if you listen to the talking heads and the pundits, they'll tell you, no, this is the worst it's ever been. And uh, you might believe that. Uh, but when you read history, you find out that there's been a lot of times when that's the worst it's ever been. And you find times in history when Christians have been under incredible pressure to conform, and yet they have been able to stay strong, and God has been faithful. Uh, I think it was Winston Churchill who said that those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. There is something good about history. It gives you a perspective on where you're at in, in your world today. So 
we like to do that. So this year, uh, we went up north in Michigan for a couple of days for our vacation. <clears throat> and uh, on the way back, our historical moment was at the uh, Gerald Ford Presidential Museum. Never been there. Uh, just beautiful, incredible place. And um, we were walking through all the different exhibits. And uh, as I looked at everything, the one thing that just kind of stuck with me or grabbed my attention was the correspondence that they had in case that you could see. Little, some of them were formal letters, but a lot of things were informal letters, little notes, pieces of paper, uh, something that uh, former President Ford had um, just kind of marked down. It was in his mind at that moment, and he was shaping some ideas in his thinking or his uh, cabinet and staff would uh, jot down something real quick and give it to him. And when you look at those little pieces of paper, and I'm sure when they first wrote them, they, they didn't even realize how that little piece of paper and what was on it would actually set the course for some historical events in the world and in our nation that you and I are still reaping the benefits from today. And uh, as I was thinking about that correspondence, I was also thinking about what I'm going to preach when I get back. Yeah, that never goes away. Um, and so we're going to start a new series this morning, and uh, we're going to look at a letter that reminds me a lot of those pieces of paper and, and correspondence, because I think when this letter was first written, I'm not sure that the author would have had any idea of how, how important it would become uh, in, in the world. Uh, not just the secular world, but within Christianity itself. Um, I don't think he probably grasped that. And the letter I'm, I'm thinking about this morning is the book of Romans. When Paul wrote the book of Romans, he was really writing his heart uh, to this group of people, things that he wanted them to know about some important subjects, but he was really sharing his heart. Uh, but it is a letter that has gone so, so far beyond its original uh, audience, and I think it is safe to say, this is not a stretch to say this morning, that a lot of scholars and people, even some secular people, consider Romans to be one of the greatest pieces of literature that's ever been written. And there are numbers of scholars that believe it to be the greatest letter ever uh, written in the New Testament, some the greatest letter ever written that makes up our Bible. And if you go back and kind of uh, review this letter's history, you're going to find that it has been linked to some of the greatest spiritual moments in our world and in our country. Uh, numerous revivals uh, in other parts of the world and even in our own country when it was kind of first founded and then you have the first awakening and the second awakening. A lot of those things were tied to people hearing and thinking upon and becoming connected again to the book of Romans. In fact, the book of Romans probably um, set in motion what was the greatest change ever to what we think of as Christianity when in 1517, a monk by the name of Martin Luther was actually studying this book and reading it and teaching it in a Catholic university and he began to think about things and it challenged him to finally stand up to the Roman Catholic Church of which he was a part and begin to point out some areas that just did not seem to match with where they were doctrinally, particularly uh, the issue of salvation. How does a person become right with God? And uh, not only Martin Luther, but others got into this book and it eventually birthed what we know of today as Protestantism, of which you and I are the children of that within uh, the evangelical kind of denomination. Uh, one theologian said this about the book of Romans. I want you to see it. He said this. He said, there has never been and probably will never be an important spiritual movement in the history of the church that cannot be connected to Romans. You know, a lot of us talk about how we would love to see a revival. We need a revival. Well, listen this morning. Revival is not going to start out there. It's not. You know where it's going to start? It's going to start in here. God always starts with his people. 
and revives them, refreshes them, so then they become the catalyst to go out into their culture and make a difference. And so if that's where our heart is, and I know that's where my heart's at to see some things, uh, I think this is a great book to spend some time in and um, let it just soak into us. It may well change our lives in some incredible ways as it has others. And so um, we're going to be spending some time in Romans over the next months, months. Uh, we're we're going to walk through this book. Uh, we'll do it for a while, take a little break. We'll need a break, and then we'll go back and, and pick it up. But we're going to spend some time in this wonderful book. Uh, Paul wrote Romans around 56 to 57 AD. He wrote it from Corinth. So he writes this letter uh, in the latter part of his ministry. He will be put to death somewhere around the year 63, 64. So he's writing this maybe six, seven years out before the end of his ministry and life. It is his longest letter, and uh, it's just safe to say it is his most theologically deep letter. And we're going to have to wade through a lot of theology for preachers. That's like, yay, going to have fun for you. It's like, oh, no, it really, it, it is theology that speaks to practical living. He just covers so many pieces of theology. And we're going we're gonna to walk through those. And look, I'm going to be up front with you. There are some things Paul writes, even in this book, they're really hard to understand. And I don't have any delusions that uh, I'm going to finally have figured it out after 2,000 years of church history. Uh, and there's going to be things that people in this book disagree on, and that's okay. And when we get there, we'll talk about them. I'll tell you where I'm at and why I'm at. And if you see it different, well, we'll still be brothers and sisters, and we'll keep on moving and learning from the book. Uh, what makes this book also different is I think, if I'm correct, this is the only book that Paul writes that is written to a church he did not found and he has never, ever been to. The church at Rome started in a different way. Paul never started this church. And uh, it will be about two years after he writes this letter that he will then finally make his way to Rome. But it's not the way Paul wanted to go. Paul's going to go as a prisoner in chains uh, to Rome to appeal his case before Caesar because he's a Roman citizen. So he has that right uh, to appeal his case to the emperor, and that is exactly what he does. Uh, if you read the book of Acts, go and read the last couple of chapters sometime this week, and you will find when Paul gets to Rome, he will spend at least two years in house arrest. And during that two years, the people that make up this audience that he wrote to will be coming in and out to see him, and he most likely expanded upon what he wrote to them in this letter. Now, our focus today is going to be the first seven verses. It is the introduction to the book. So let's uh, read that together, and then we're going to come back and kind of walk our way through what we're going to find there today. It says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed or declared the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him we've received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his namesake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, this is also the longest introduction that Paul has in any of his letters, and it is long because, again, Paul's never been to this church, so Paul's kind of saying, here's who I am, here's what I'm called to do, and here's what my ministry looks like, but there's something more to this introduction this morning, and this is where we're going to spend our time. Most people see in this introduction not just Paul saying, hi, I'm Paul, and this is who I am. It is Paul um, giving an encapsulated preview of the things that he is going to enlarge upon 
later in the letter. But what Paul's going to do is right out of the bat, because this is a church living in difficult circumstances, they're under a lot of pressure, Uh, there's some things going on inside the church that are causing issues, and so what Paul, many think Paul does in this introduction is he tends to hit those big themes that he's going to unravel later to get them thinking about them. They are things that Paul believes are critical to the life of the church in Rome. And so what we're going to do today is that's where we're going to start, and we're going to consider those key truths or doctrines that we're going to revisit and revisit in the months ahead. And I think what we're going to see is they are critical for the church. They were critical for the church in Rome, and they're critical for the church right here called Oak Bend. And uh, we need to get these things straight if we're to have the impact God intends us to have and be able to live with each other the way God intends. So this morning, four key truths in Romans. Uh, We're just going to generally go over them. We'll get them in a deeper fashion later in the series. Uh, I'm going to put them under four words. Here's the first one this morning. Paul starts with the issue of identity. Notice Paul gives his name. He says, this is who I am. I'm Paul. And then he talks about what God sent him to do. It was to be an apostle. It means a sent one. This is his calling. But the thing that I want to bear down on, notice how Paul describes his place before Christ. He says, a servant of Christ Jesus. A servant. And that word there comes, or probably could be better translated, a slave. That's what Paul is saying. I am a slave of Christ Jesus. And uh, the world that Paul's writing to, uh, slavery is the essence of the Roman Empire. There would be no Roman Empire where they're not for slavery. Uh, It's estimated that somewhere between a third to up to half of the people at some time in the Roman Empire were slaves. They served in the army. They served the needs of other people. Uh, Slavery was just what made the Roman Empire run. And when they conquered people, sometimes they enslaved them because that's what made their economy go, their world go, their gladiator games go. Uh, So they would have understood uh, this, this statement of Paul's that I'm a slave because they would have experienced it themselves. And to be a slave is to belong to another person. To be a slave is to take your orders from another person. To be a slave is to get your assignment for your life from another person. To be a slave is to submit and be humble to another person. And that does not set well with us as Americans. We do not value that. We value a culture of freedom and a culture of self-expression. And there's a good side to that. There is. But what we have to realize is it's still nonetheless true if we are Christians, we have to come to grips with the fact that we are slaves. And we are slaves to Jesus. To be a Christian in the truest sense of the word, is to belong to someone else who has paid for you, bought you, and now owns you. Now, when we read this letter, we're going to find out that we are a lot more than just slaves. Paul's going to talk about how we're not condemned. Paul's going to talk about how we're sons and daughters of God. He's going to name a lot of things that we are in our identity. But at the basic level, and that's where Paul starts, the basic level, our basic identity in Christ is that we are slaves. We have now become owned by another. By the way, if you bristle at that this morning, just the whole concept of that, uh, when we get to Romans 6, and particularly verse 16, what Paul is going to remind everybody of, everybody, is that everybody's a slave. You realize that? 
Everybody's a slave. Paul's going to say, to whomever you give yourself, or to whatever you give yourself, you will become its slave, and it becomes your master. And that's just the reality. If you give yourself to money and the making of money, and that's your whole life, that's your master, and you're its slave. If you give to your passions, and that's what you want to fulfill, that's your master, and you're its slave. Here's the thing. You can't help being a slave. You can't help who's your master. That's the difference that you get. And so Paul says, look, I'm a slave. And by the way, hey, Romans, just a reminder, you're a slave too, because Romans valued freedom. They worked for their freedom. Paul says, you may be free in that sense, but you're still always, as a believer, going to be a slave. That is the best basic level identity, and it's so important for us to just get a hold of that and let that set the course for our life and our service to God. Because if, if you see yourself as yours, your life, your choice, your career, your days, your things. The problem is with that, that not only will you be tempted to handle all of those things in a way other than what God may want, most likely you will, and particularly if it gets difficult and the pressure's on to stand for Christ, to be obedient in a difficult moment. Why would I want to do that when it's my life and my choices? But... If it's not my life and my choices and I belong to someone else, well, that, that suddenly makes that situation look very, very different, or it should. So Paul reminds us uh, one of the things he's going to just hammer at over and over is identity in this letter, who we are. And so he says, look, let's just get basic level. What we really are is we are slaves to Jesus. That's what we are. Here's the second word this morning that Paul will deal with. It is gospel. And if there's one large overarching theme in this letter, it is this theme. It is the theme of the gospel. In this letter, Paul is going to unpack for us what the gospel is. By the way, uh, just think, how would you define the gospel? If you define the gospel as Jesus died for me, that's true. That is not the whole gospel, and we'll see that. You say, well, what is it? I don't know. You're going to have to come. Then you can find out or read the letter. But what he's going to do is he's going to unpack what the gospel is, and it's much bigger sometimes than we think about it in individualistic terms. And he's going to talk about how the gospel should be impacting our lives. Uh, the word gospel itself, you probably know, it means good news. It's, it, it, that word is not necessarily biblical, uh, but it, it, it's what's it's used for the gospel that God gives. It's God's good news is what it is. It's God's good news to a fallen and broken humanity and world about what he has come to do for them and for the world to restore it, to heal it, to put it back to like it was meant to be, and to do that through the person of his son, Jesus Christ. And I want you to note a couple of things that Paul says about God's good news here. One is he talks about the uniqueness of God's good news. Do you notice what he says here? He says, it is the gospel, verse 2, the gospel he promised beforehand in the Holy Scriptures. Okay, Paul's talking about the Old Testament. Paul is saying, look, the gospel that I'm giving you, the gospel I'm sharing is not a man-made thing. It is not rooted in the acts and ideas of a fallen, weakened humanity. Paul is saying this is a gospel that is rooted in the will in the will and the actions of God. And he has revealed that in a place, and that is in his written revelation to man, both Old Testament and New Testament. Now look, the Old Testament foretells in symbols and in prophecy of a coming Redeemer that's going to put the world right. 
That's why you have an Old Testament. The New Testament is the capstone on that because it gives you who that person is that's going to fix, redeem, save a broken, fallen humanity and world. And it is none other than Paul says here, Jesus Christ. And look at what Paul says about this Redeemer. He says, verse 3, regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant or was born of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed or declared the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Not only is there a uniqueness to the gospel Paul preaches, but Paul's going to say, look, there's also an exclusivity to the gospel that I preach. And notice what he says. He says that exclusivity comes in this person called Jesus. And notice how he describes Jesus. One, he says, as to his earthly life, he is a descendant or born of of David. He's speaking about his humanity. He's saying, look, this Jesus who came was actually human, and he is in the line of David. And if you know the Old Testament prophecy, David was given, I think it's in First or Second Samuel 14, he was given a prophecy that his line wouldn't end. There would always and there would be an eternal king who would sit on his throne. And of course, who is that? It's Jesus who became human. But Paul also reminds us here that he says, this one who became human and was put to death, resurrected from the dead. And he says, look, the resurrection of Jesus is God's declaration. It is God's statement that says, look, that's my son, that's my only son, and that's the only redeemer I'm sending. It's kind of like the wedding ring that we have on our hands. When I put that wedding ring on, you know what that says? Looking across at my wife, Kathy, it says that's the only one right there. That's it. That's the one I'm marrying. That's the one I'm living with. That's my wife. That's what the resurrection is. It's this kind of declaration. It's this setting out that Jesus is unlike anybody else and that this is God's son and this is the redeemer he has sent. The centerpiece of God's gospel is a savior, a redeemer who is both fully human and fully divine in one person, Jesus Christ. And listen, that's important. You can't do away with that. And here's why it is important. Because you need and I need both of those. Because we need somebody fully human but sinless, which Jesus was and is, to stand in our place before God, to represent us as a human, but without sin, So he can then bear our sins. And we need a God to be able to forgive us of sin. Because only God can forgive sin. Jesus is both of those in one person. The only person, only person that fits that profile in all of history, all of time, is Jesus our Lord, Paul says. That's the exclusivity to the gospel The gospel is exclusive. There's only one Savior, one way. It's inclusive in that anybody can come to that one Savior, Redeemer. And that is important because there's only one gospel that saves, but also we need to realize that like in Rome, so in our day today, there were all kinds of things passing themselves off as good news. All kinds of religions, all kinds of beliefs, all kinds of systems that said, look, just come this way. You know, just do this. Learn this. You can become your own God. You know, just come on. You can find enlightenment. We hear that stuff today. Paul lived in a culture that was filled with idolatry. And into that culture, Paul stands up and says, and listen, there's only one way that God redeems the world and brings salvation to humanity. And that is in the person of Jesus Christ. Don't fall for fakes, is what Paul's telling them. Don't fall for fakes. There's plenty of them out there, but only one that really works and really saves. Third word this morning, third doctrine, key concept Paul's going to go at, and that is the issue of 
transformation. Look at verse 5. He says, through him we, Paul speaking of himself, we've received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles, and catch this phrase, to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. The obedience that comes from faith, or you can translate that, the obedience that comes out of faith. Paul in this letter is going to tell us salvation is not just about you getting saved. It's not about just Jesus dying for you. It is not about just keeping you and me from judgment, which sin brings. And it's not about keeping us out of hell, as much as hopefully none of us want to go there. It's not about just what's to come in eternity. The gospel that Paul's going to give is about life right here, right now. And it's supposed to make a true difference. Because God is eventually going to make everything new. But guess what? The newness has started with you and me and his church. We are to enter into that process right now. By the way, listen, that's going to be a process that when you get to heaven, you're going to continue to grow and continue to learn and continue to be refined in things, in Jesus. The gospel is about saving you and me, but it's about more than that. It's about transformation. It is about trust in the work of Christ done on your behalf and mine, but that is a trust or that is a faith that leads to what Paul calls here obedience to the faith. And here's the thing, particularly as Protestants, we like to keep a big space between salvation and works. We love to keep a big one because, you know, Pastor, we're not saved by works. We're, saved, we're just saved by grace. And we like to spread it way, way out. Okay, this is going to make you really uncomfortable then with this letter because Paul doesn't do that. Paul makes them very, very close in this letter. Paul makes them very, very close in this letter. Uh, Paul sees an important, needed connection between faith and works. And he comes down strong on both of them. In fact, Paul's ideal of faith is not going to be just intellectual faith. Because listen, the devils intellectually believe what's right about Jesus. They are not going to heaven. They are not going to be redeemed. It's not just an intellectual faith. It is a faith that starts with what you believe, but it is a faith that produces a change it's obedience to the faith. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you probably might have heard that name. He lived during the uh, Second World War with the rise of the Nazis. Uh, and he confronted a church who had bought into cheap grace. You just believe it, but it doesn't cost you anything. You don't have to do anything. And uh, <clears throat> he confronted that kind of so-called faith. And I want you to see something that he wrote right here. <clears throat> Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this. He said, only the believers obey, only the obedient believe. Does that make you uncomfortable? Only believers obey, and only the obedient believe. Write that down, just chew on it this week. Only the believers obey, only the obedient believe. It's pretty much right, I think, in touch with Paul. Paul's going to stress that faith in Christ means transformation to the one who claims that faith. And by the way here, it doesn't mean that you just have to go and start gutting it out and trying to do all the kinds of right things. What Paul's going to say is, look, the salvation that comes by the Spirit of God is now going to be the same Spirit that indwells you and gives you the power to begin to change. This is not something you have to do on your own. It's something that you yield to God and cooperate with, become in step with His Spirit, and that transformation will begin to work its way out in your life. That's the ideal, and we're going to talk about what it means to live life in the Spirit in this letter, because Paul does. So, 
One of the things Paul's going to really drive on is transformation. Paul doesn't see a faith that doesn't change you. That's a dead faith. Live faith changes us, makes us different. And then last of all, one of the things Paul's going to deal with is unity. Uh, Look what he says in verse 7. He says, to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people. By the way, Oak Bend Church, just so you know this morning, you are loved by God and you are called to be his people. Take that with you. You are, just like they were. But notice how Paul phrases this. A lot of times what Paul will say is to the church at so-and-so, but he doesn't this time. This is one of those few times when Paul does not say to the church at Thessalonica, to the church, you know, here. He says to all. Because the church in Rome wasn't located in one place. It was spread out all over the empire in house churches. And here's the thing. The people there, this, this is a, a major metropolitan city. It's, it's the center of the empire. And it is a mixture of people. It is Jews. And it is the non-Jewish world, Gentiles. It is free people and slaves. It is Various ethnicities, colors, ideas, men, women. And all of them are now beginning to come to Christ, and they're sitting in the same houses together. And they've got to learn to do life together. Listen, that is a recipe for all kinds of trouble and all kinds of unrest. But not a lot different from our time, is it? Let's just put people together like us. A lot of us in here come from different church backgrounds and experiences. Um, We have a lot of different social and political viewpoints in this body. Um, We see certain things different in life. We do things different. Now, try to stick that inside of a body together and love each other and love Jesus, and that that can be difficult. And listen, just trying to grit it out to be nice together is not unity, or at least not the unity Paul's going to talk about. And so Paul's going to stress in this letter the great need to truly come together with all of your differences and learn how to be one unified people for the cause of the gospel. And we're going to look at some of the things he says and how to do that. The gospel is what we say has the power to change us and change our world. So, what does it say when the world looks in our windows and we can't get along? We can't stand each other. We can't get unified around the things that matter. So Paul is going to really bear down on unity in this letter. So he thinks about identity, thinks about gospel, thinks about transformation, and he thinks about unity. Four things critical to our life as the church in the world. And we're going to look at those in a much deeper fashion as we go through this letter. So here's what I want to do this morning. I want to challenge you, first of all, read the book of Romans. If you've read it, read it again. Just just kind of cruise through it over these next months. Spend some time thinking about it. And think about these four things that we've mentioned this morning. Don't let these go. How do you identify yourself today as a believer? Do you ever think in terms that you're a slave? By the way, are you living that way today? I'm going to just say, you may come to church every week, But have you really embraced the gospel that Paul's talking about? Have you really embraced the one person that Paul's talking about? That's Jesus. That is God's way to redemption, salvation, and eternal life. How's that transformation going today? Paul's not talking about perfection. If he were, we're all done for But he is talking about change. Are you changing? Have you been changing? 
Can you look back and say, man, six months ago, that was an issue. But you know what? I can see that getting better. I can see that conforming more to the image of Jesus and his commands. And are you committed to unity? By the way, unity does not mean uniformity. So no, we are never going to agree on everything, look alike and all that stuff. That's not what it is. But it is being like-minded about the most important things. So think about where you're at. Ask God to open your heart to this letter. Because my, my hope is this letter will do what it's done before and that it will just spark a renewal in us, a passion in us. It will really become a catalyst to change us more and more into the people he wants us to be and to be able to affect that world that God has left us in. Let's pray together. Father, this morning, thank you for the gift of your word and for the gift of your son, who is like Jesus, nobody. And we thank you for sending him for us. Father, as we begin our time in this letter that has shaped so much of Christianity and so many believers over the centuries, I I pray that it will do the same for me and it will do the same for all who hear it in the months ahead, that you will truly revive us, rekindle our heart for the gospel, rekindle our heart for obedience, rekindle our heart for a world that you deeply love, but like us, deeply needs the gospel and the Savior about which the gospel is all about. Father, work this into us. Shape us by the word of God and the living word, our Lord Jesus. And now prepare our hearts as we come to the Lord's table to remember all that Jesus did for us. Amen and amen. I'm going to prepare our hearts this morning for communion. Uh, if you'd like, you can go ahead and open and take the bread out. Paul quotes these words. They come from David in one of the Psalms, but he says, Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against him. You know what? We all need that to be true of us because we all have sins. We all have transgressions. What Paul's going to say and what the rest of Scripture says is God does that. But he does it through the gift of his son. And because of Jesus, our transgressions are forgiven, our sins are covered, and none of them will ever be counted against us. That's what we remember. We remember how that came to be when we come to the Lord's table this morning. Paul goes into detail a little bit about how all of that comes to be in the book of Colossians. I want you to hear what he says. He says, once you, that's you plural, were alienated from God, you were enemies in your mind, Because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's body, physical body, through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. How can he do that? Because Christ in his body lived a sinless, perfect life for you and me. This bread is a reminder. It's a symbol of that body of Jesus lived for us, given for us, so that the sins we committed in our body could be forgiven. Let's eat the bread together this morning with thankfulness. And I would invite you to open the cup this morning. 
it's not just the body of Jesus that leads us to freedom. It's the giving of that body, the giving of that life. Paul said, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on the earth are things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. It's not just that Jesus gave his body lived perfectly, but Jesus gave that body in which was his life by the pouring out of his blood to cover our sins and let us stand clean before a holy God. This cup is a reminder of that blood shed for you and me. Let's drink together. Could I invite you to stand this morning? In a morning moment, we're gonna sing about the love of God, but can we just take a moment and thank God for that love given to us in Jesus? Father, we thank you this morning for Jesus. Lord, may this be uh, a moment when we commit ourselves once again to the reality that we are his slaves. And yet at the same time, we are sons and daughters deeply, deeply loved by the Father and demonstrated through the giving of Jesus's life for us. Thank you, Father, for that great gift of Christ through which we have life here and life to come. We bless you and we praise you. Amen and amen. <clears throat> As we finish this morning, just a reminder, the gospel is for the salvation of our souls, but the gospel of Matthew also reminds us that Jesus came to heal and touch our bodies. And you may be here this morning, and maybe it's your soul that needs redemption, or maybe it's your body that needs healing. Can I encourage you this morning not to walk out those doors? Take a step up here. 
Mark and Therese. You can come to either one of them or me. Let us just pray with you. Bring those needs to God. God is still a healer. God is still a redeemer. And we believe that he works. And we want to always give him that opportunity. So again, if that's you, please take a few moments and step up today and let us join with you. Father, we love you this morning. We again thank you for your son. May we always make much of him here. May we lift him up here. He is our salvation. He is our wisdom, our wholeness, our healing. He is all the things that we need and will ever need to be right with you and to live forever in your presence. Father, this day as we walk out of these doors, make us mindful. We walk out as slaves to Jesus, but he's a good master, a merciful master, a kind one who lives and works for our good. And Lord, as we live this week, make us mindful of people who need the good news and give us that open door and then give us the courage to open our mouths and share Jesus with them. If I be lifted up, Jesus said, I will draw all men to me. Let us lift him up as he was lifted on the cross. We pray that in Christ's name today. Amen. Have a great Sunday. Have a good week. Thank you.